Good afternoon. Welcome to the afternoon sessions of our conference. My name is Christoph Kams. I work in the Monetary Policy Department of the ECB. It's my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon, Daryl Duffy. Daryl is, of course, well known in, the, in these circles. He's the Adams Distinguished Professor of Management and Professor of Finance at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. His impressive career is marked by many very influential studies in the fields of finance and economics. Of particular relevance for us, of course, today is his groundbreaking work on the implications of central bank balance sheet normalization. When preparing for this session, I realized that uh, Daryl had given a speech uh, almost two years ago uh, at one of our conferences. In that speech, Daryl looked back at the turmoil in US repo markets in mid-September 2019. As you all know, that episode marked the end of the first balance sheet normalization phase that had started in 2017. In October 2022, when you last spoke to us, the current balance sheet normalization episode was still in its, in its, in its infancy. Today, two years on, considerable progress has been made, and as Isabel explained in her opening speech this morning. But even if balance sheet normalization has progressed smoothly so far, there are of course uncertainties about the level of reserves and how far they can decline without causing disruptions. Against this background, Daryl's talk today is most relevant and very ti timely. The talk is entitled Gauging the Minimum Ample Quantity of Reserves, and I'm very much looking forward to your insights. You have 40 minutes, which will leave us some time for questions from the audience. Daryl, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Christoph. What a, what a pleasure. <clears throat> It's just a terrific pleasure uh, to be back at the ECB. Uh, let's make this as fun and engaging and conversational as possible over the next 40 minutes, and then we have time for Q&A. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to uh, bring in some uh, research by Adam Copeland, who's at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and Elin Yang, who's a former PhD student at Stanford, now in Hong Kong. Uh, but I'm, I'm not speaking for them. I'm going uh, wider ranging into uh, a list of policy-related uh, concerns. And uh, near the end of my remarks, I'm going to try to suggest uh, um, ways to mitigate the problems that uh, I'm addressing, which is the problem of having a sufficient amount of reserves in the system, and which will also actually bring back many of the themes from this morning. I mean, Isabel's remarks in particular, they're going to come back resonating again, <clears throat> especially in the context of the United States financial system, which is different in, in some key respects, as we'll see. So let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, the title of the talk is very, it's very pointed to what I'm discussing today. I want to understand how a central bank will know when it's getting too low uh, in terms of the reserves that are available and how it can use the available uh, bank balance sheets, its own balance sheet, uh, and the uh, supply of reserves more efficiently, uh, given the situation that we're in now. Just to bring everybody back, uh, Christoph mentioned the events in September 2019 in the United States, uh, which I'll refer to in a moment. At that point, there were 1.6 trillion of reserves in the US financial system. There are now literally double that quantity, and already banking analysts are warning the Fed, uh, you better slow down it's coming to the point where there's not going to be enough. How will we know? So uh, first, I want to uh, portray uh, the central tension that we're talking about. Why, why wouldn't the central bank want to supply lots and lots of reserves and have a very big balance sheet? And th these issues came up this morning uh, on, on, the, on the dangers of having an excessively large balance sheet. Well, there's the footprint concern. There are crowding out issues. Uh, particularly with the uh, situation in which the reserves count for capital requirements under the leverage ratio rules that we all have, but also uh, the potential for the central bank to displace commercial banks in providing liquidity to the market, the potential for people in legislatures, whatever the country, uh, to use the central bank's balance sheet if it gets big enough, or to instruct the central bank to use its balance sheet and uh, with the consequent uh, costs in terms of the independence of the central bank. Uh, 
And then a more parochial concern, but it is a concern of the, uh, with the central banks that I've spoken to, is that they don't really like a highly volatile income associated with paying banks interest on reserves. Uh, and that also raises uh, some optical or political issues for central banks. But on the other hand, if central banks br bring down their balance sheets uh, too aggressively, whether too quickly or too far, bad things can happen. So for example, uh, you can get eventually fragmentation in rates markets. You can get rates popping all over the place uh, where central banks are, uh, are not actually hitting their targets. Uh, you can also get uh, reputational costs. Uh, commenters will start asking, as they did after September 2019, does the central bank really know what it's doing? Can we trust that it will do this in the future? And then uh, in the most extreme cases, you can get financial instability. If there are not enough reserves in the system, you can get a situation with cash hoarding, which can feed back onto itself and cause problems uh, with uh, firms actually outside of the bank banking system having difficulty in rolling over their uh, short-term uh, borrowing. So that's the big picture, cost benefit, in a very uh, short uh, summary. But let's look at the events of 2019 again, because they're quite instructive in the United States. So this plot from uh, my paper with Adam and Elin has on the left-hand side axis in red, the difference between the secured overnight financing rate, which is the main index for repo markets in the United States, currently covering about 2.5 trillion of overnight borrowing in the repo market. So it's a very robust, big, uh, important index for uh, financing. Uh, the difference between that rate and the interest on reserves that the Fed offers to banks. And if monetary policy transmission is working perfectly, that, rate, that spread should be very close to zero because if money markets are efficient, the opportunity to lend almost risklessly in the repo market and the opportunity to lend risklessly to the central bank will be uh, arbitraged if the rates are different. So you want, you'll go to whichever rate is more attractive since they're both overnight risk-free rates. On the other hand, though, uh, we all know that reserves are useful not only as an overnight investment, they are what I would call the Swiss army knife of finance. They serve so many different purposes and banks really want them uh, for many reasons that came up this morning including managing their uh, liquidity risks. You can see that that rate uh, jumped very dramatically uh, by 300 basis points in the middle of September 2019, when it appeared that the Fed had brought down its balance sheet too far at about uh, 1.5 trillion or so. Um, but that scale is misleading. The rate spike on that uh, day was 300 basis points, and we normally think of 10 to 20 basis points as an excessive bump in that spread. And if you had a magnifying glass or binoculars and you zero in on uh, everything up to COVID, you can see a lot of spikes during uh, that period that are up to 50 basis points, including a spike of uh, almost 50 basis points when COVID hit. Many think that the COVID spike is related to the events of COVID itself or to bond market functioning, but it was actually the primary culprit was not enough reserves, and I hope to convince you of that in a few moments. Uh, on the uh, right-hand axis in blue are the reserves held by the most active bank holding companies in the repo market. So these are the 10 firms that we selected based on the fact that they do more repo than any other firm in the US financial system. They're all bank holding companies. We have detailed data on them because Adam Copeland is at the New York Fed, so he knows everything. <clears throat> you can see that uh, those re uh, amounts of reserves are not a very good predictor of when rates are going to spike, when they're, when they're at a particularly low level, like uh, on the order of four to $500 billion. They can move around somewhat, but it's not predictable what day you're going to get a spike. So simply looking, and this is a theme I'll return to, simply looking at that rate spread and uh, basing that, uh, using that as a basis for when you need to increase reserves is not a satisfactory warning signal, despite the fact that still most central bankers refer to the old pool model of the 1960s and suggest that when they see that rate spread climbing a little bit that it's time to add reserves. That can be too late, as we saw in September 2019. It's also uh, 
a misconception that the total amount of reserves uh, grew a lot where it mattered between September 2019 and COVID. Where it mattered was at those 10 most repo active dealer banks, their quantities of reserves were really uh, where the concern was. So distribution of reserves in the system really does matter. They're much more predictive of problems in financing markets. After the COVID uh, shock though, because of bond market functioning and then quantitative easing, the Fed uh, bought enormous quantities of securities, treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities, and drove up the, qual the quantity of reserves held by these 10 most active uh, dealer banks to the point at which there were really no concerns, uh, at least until the last few weeks, <laughs> about, the, uh, about functioning in US repo markets. The, that red line became as tame as a pussycat, didn't move around at all because the, the system was saturated with reserves as a byproduct of uh, the Fed's huge uh, expansion of its balance sheet. Now, what I, what I want to do is to kind of dive into the details of how we will be able to gauge how low reserves can go. And I'm not going to focus on total reserves. I'm going to focus on the big bank reserves and whether that alone is a sufficient indicator of problems. So um, as I just mentioned, rate spreads are not a great uh, gauge of the ampleness of reserves. I know that might be heresy in the world of central banking, but uh, based on our research, uh, there can be structural changes in the financial system uh, that cause uh, uh, what is a relatively quiescent financing market to become very volatile in a short amount of time uh, in terms of warning with respect to how much uh, reserves are necessary, watching reserves might not work, and watching those rate spreads might not work. Uh, the reason that you have these big structural changes are changes in liquidity regulation, stress tests, and discount window policy, all of which have, have been in flux in the United States over the past few years. Bank capital regulations also change from time to time. The regulation of money funds has caused a major change in the demand and supply of reserves to the market. And then finally, as uh, pointed out by Acharya and Rajan, which came up in the last session this morning, uh, the, uh, there is a kind of ratchet effect uh, that, that's hard to disentangle. As reserves grow, banks rely more on reserves to provide deposits to their depositors than they feel they need more reserves to back those deposits with sufficient liquidity. And it becomes difficult to gauge how much of the reserves that have been built up are actually necessary at a particular point in time given the history. So I'm going to point, uh, I'm going to point elsewhere when looking for some kind of a signal, an early warning signal for when uh, reserves might be getting too low. And my, my gaze is focused here specifically on the, US, uh, on the US financial system. This is where in the talk, I don't think many of the lessons that we're learning in the US might be transferable to other central banks. And I'll explain why that's the case in the next few minutes. So here are the two key variables in uh, the study that uh, Adam Elin and I did, in the left-hand panel, you're looking at the sensitivity of that repo to central bank rate spread. That is the interest rate spread that's of concern. When that spread is high, it's bad. The sensitivity of that spread to the quantity of reserves held by the, the 10 largest, uh, most active banks in the repo market. And you can see on, on the horizontal axis, is the percentile at which you're looking at that rate spread. So on the left side is 65 percentile, that's, uh, and on the right side, you're getting up towards 100 percentile, which is the most extreme situation. And you can see quite a lot of nonlinearity in that sensitivity. When, you're, when repo rate spreads are very high, meaning the market is highly stressed for lack of liquidity, the most sense, one of the most sensitive uh, drivers of that is the amount of reserves held by those 10 most active banks. Uh, and that's up for the obvious reason that they are at the hub of the financing of uh, securities, particularly treasuries and agency MBS. And when they're getting a little bit low on reserves, they start to provide financing uh, in much more expensive terms. That's economics 101, nothing new to anybody here. The right-hand plot might be new to some of you. That's 
an even more powerful signal in terms of R squared if you run horse races. And in a minute, I'll give you a policy reason that it's a more, it's a more reliable signal. And that is on the vertical axis, the coefficient of dependence of that rate spread on how late in the day those 10 most active banks are receiving their payments from other banks. Let me repeat that. If the time of day is 1 o'clock, that they normally would receive half of the payments they will receive on that day. But on today, if it's instead of 1 o'clock, it's 1.30, then that's a 30-minute delay relative to normal. A 30-minute delay is important. The standard deviation of those delays in our sample period, which covers 2017 to 2023, is about one hour. So when you get to one hour later than normal, the largest banks are receiving their incoming payments one hour later than normal. They have some premonition even early in the day that they're going to be getting paid late, and they don't want to provide funding as liberally to others. Why, why is that? I'm, I'm going to run a little experiment uh, with all of you uh, about why you, if you were a bank, might be concerned about the time at which you're going to get paid. So uh, there are two variables that you have in mind. How much reserves you start the day with, and then how much reserves will be coming in in the course of the day and when it's going to be coming in. Let's, let's all uh, think introspect. I'm going to give you each 10 plastic poker chips. Make them red. So you all have 10 red plastic poker chips. And I'm going to give each of you a list of 10 counterparties to whom you must pay in total 50 during the day. So you have 10, you must pay 50. And you need to ask, how is that possible if I start the day with 10 that I could pay 50? And the answer is, of course, that you're going to be on the list of somebody else. And you're going to be getting some poker chips. And you're going to be hoping that they send you the poker chips before you have to meet uh, all 50 that you have to pay out. And you're playing this a game of, well, maybe I should pay later today because it looks like other banks are paying me later today. And that could result in a coordination failure, or what economists call a strategic complementarity effect, by which when there's a sense that banks are paying each other later, that they will indeed pay each other later. It will be a self-fulfilling expectation. Now, um, I'm going to pick on the bank of uh, Pelizzone, Loriana, my colleague over in the second row. I'm going to tell Loriana, today, you're, you're one of these large uh, repo active banks. But for you, I'm only going to give you five poker chips because your reserves are low. And now you're going to think about, wow, this is going to be stressful because I have to pay out 50. I've only got five to start with. These proportions, by the way, are not unrealistic. For the very largest US banks, they pay out on the order of five to 10 times what they start the day with. So uh, Loriana, uh, maybe uh, Luke in front of her, is uh, calling her early in the morning when the repo market is most active. It pretty much clears by 7.30 or 8 in the morning. And Luke is asking Loriana for a loan in the repo market. And Loriana is saying, well, I've only got five chips. And I'm going to have a hard time, as it is, uh, to meet all my outgoing payment obligations. So I'm only going to lend to Luke uh, if it's an extremely opportunistic uh, situation in which I'm charging him a number way above the interest rate that I can get at the Fed, because I don't want to, uh, I don't want to fail. I could overdraft at the Fed, but that's a no-no in the US system. I don't know what it's like here in Europe. For the very largest banks, overdrafting is essentially uh, long ago, a long ago phenomenon. US banks, are the largest ones, are now expected uh, to provide their own liquidity and not to need to go to the Fed. Uh, for additional liquidity. So going back to the right-hand uh, uh, panel on this diagram, you can see that uh, as you get to higher and higher percentiles of this rate spread, where markets are getting more and more stressed, Loriana is thinking more and more about how late in the day she's going to get paid when she considers the rate that she offers to Luke on that early morning repo rate. Uh, and you know, uh, at 100 minutes, which is not outside of, the, outside of the sample by far. It's a 13, minute, a 13 basis point extra effect. And it can get even bigger. Now, between the left-hand panel and the right-hand panel, you've got two signals to rely upon. One is the quantity of reserves sitting in these banks. And the other is how late in the day they're getting paid. The second one is revealed preference at the moment about how stressed the market is for reserves. 
It's how late in the day they're getting paid. The left-hand side one, it's very difficult for policymakers and central banks, those setting the quantity of reserves, to know how much is enough. Remember, we have twice as much in the US now as we did in 2019 when problems occurred, and yet already warning signs are showing up. This is a scatter plot on the horizontal axis of the quantity of reserves held by other large banks, meaning of the 100 largest banks in the system, not the 10 most active repo banks, but the next 90. So that, that ranges in our sample period uh, from about 500 billion to about uh, 2 trillion. And on the vertical axis is the time from sample mean at which Loriana is going to get half of her incoming payments today. And you can see the, 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 the obvious uh, relationship. When uh, the other banks have low reserves, they're paying Loriana later in the day. That's the mechanism at work. When the system has small amounts of reserves, they're going to pay the largest banks of the system later in the day, and the largest banks in the system are going to quote worse rates to anyone looking for funding that morning. Uh, I'm colorblind, but it, you should, if you're really good color vision, you should be able to see 20 red dots in this uh, scatter plot by day. I don't know if anybody, can anyone see a red dot in the picture? Oh, well, fantastic. Okay, those 20 dots are the days uh, on which the repo rate uh, to uh, central bank deposit rate spread was at its most extreme. And they're not coincidentally along the top of this diagram when banks were getting paid late. And the worst day of all, actually there were two very bad days for repo rate spreads. The worst of all was September 2017. That is the uppermost, leftmost red dot in the diagram. No coincidence. Uh, by the way, the only dot that's a little bit higher occurred in March, on March, uh, I believe it was the 15th, mid-March, the COVID era, where uh, reserves were not ample enough. Believe it or not. Uh, so uh, delayed incoming payments was the main cause of a very elevated repo rate on, uh, in mid-March. That's a 69% R squared. Here is the early warning sign uh, that I would suggest for the US system, but probably not uh, for other central banks for reasons I'll describe. So this is the lagging 10-day average of that time of day by which Loriana is getting half of her incoming payments. Loriana standing as a representative for the 10 largest repo active banks in the United States financial system. Uh, this, uh, as we moved towards September 2019, if, you had, if we had done our research, unfortunately, about five years earlier, we would have had a very good early warning that problems were creeping up and they were visible in the payment system. The, the largest banks that are active in funding markets were getting paid later and later and later each day. Plenty of early warning relative to the other early, early warning signals that I mentioned, which are the level of reserves held by the largest banks or the rate spreads themselves, which sudden, suddenly popped from near zero to 300 basis points. And by the way, intraday in the interdealer market, they went up by 1,000 basis points on September the 17th, 2019. So <clears throat> that is a very good early warning system, early warning signal for the United States system. Once the Fed stepped in, that uh, timing variable went down. It jumped up again on COVID, and then it came down, and it has been uh, quite low since then. I haven't asked Adam for the latest readouts uh, from the New York Fed. I think they're proprietary. Uh, so that's a key takeaway for today. Uh, look at how late the biggest banks are getting paid. That is an active variable. By the way, it's the bank that sends the payment that chooses when to send it. That's crucial information. Another, by the way, is that all of the variation in lateness is coming from large value payments, not small ones. Loriana might say, well, I'm going to be okay because others are going to pay me later, but I can pay others later. No, that doesn't work. These 10 repo dealer banks have tons of large value obligations early in the day that are not elastic to the amount of reserves or to the rate in the system. These are things like settlements of repo, settlements of treasury auctions, and treasury cash sales. So, uh, so for, whatever, for whatever reason, the large banks have not set themselves up to offset 
late incoming payments with late outco outgoing payments. They re rely on markets and the central bank to cover them, and lots and lots of reserves, so don't starve them of reserves. Okay, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna switch the conversation for the last, for the last few minutes to why we th need to think not only about whether reserves are sufficiently ample, but also whether the total capacity of the balance sheets of those banks is sufficient in terms of meeting their capital requirements. It's a separate but related issue. It's related because reserves count against your capital requirements. I mean, my view, they shouldn't. I'll come back to that. Uh, but uh, at the end of September 30th of this year, that is just uh, uh, not even two months ago, or about two months, uh, yeah, not even two months ago, there was a hiccup in, the, uh, in US funding markets at the quarter end. And I'm showing here three key benchmarks the reverse for purchase facility rate. This is the rate at which money funds can invest money in the Fed directly through a repurchase facility. The interest on reserve balances, which was 4.9% at that time. And uh, the standing repo facility and discount window rates, which were 10 basis points higher. Now, Isabel spoke this morning about how the, the, the Euro system is working on a demand-based system with the idea being that if uh, banks need more funding, they don't have to have a ton of reserves all the time, they can come to the European Central Bank to get funding as needed. And so in principle, you wouldn't see a lot of uh, exec rates executed above, in the US, above the discount window rate or the standing uh, repo facility rate, but we did. On that quarter end, uh, SOFR, which is a $2.5 trillion aggregate of treasury repo financing rates, settled at 5.22%, well above the window rate. And the uh, upper quartile showed that 600 billion of repos were done well above the standing uh, repo facility rate. So this, the, uh, you, the people in the Fed are gonna be thinking very, I know a number are here, gonna be thinking very carefully, what does that mean about the effectiveness of the standing repo facility. By the way, it was drawn in size for the first time, but only 2.6 billion relative to 600 billion at much higher rates. So it wasn't a perfect or uh, close substitute for many uh, participants in the repo market when they needed financing. The next day, something similar happened. It wasn't the quarter end, but there was still some settling out of all of the uh, disruption that happened on the previous day. And again, we saw elevated uh, interest rates in the repo market. And uh, uh, again, over 600 billion at rates well in excess of the standing repo facility rate. By the way, for plotting, what I've plotted here is not so for itself because it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's got composition effects. It comes from many different segments of the market, ranging from tri-party to inter-dealer, what I'm plotting here is the GCF repo rates, uh, which although a smaller segment of, of the universe uh, of uh, treasury repo rates is a very homogeneous rate. It's all centrally cleared general collateral. So there is no special effects and there are really no counterparty effects since everyone is dealing with the central counterparty. Uh, very quickly, the rates came back to normal. Well, I'm gonna return in a few moments to whether or not uh, the standing repo facility is uh, likely to meet its intended purpose. And I, I think it's too early to say. This was the first real test. There could have been startup problems. Uh, there, could be, there could be other concerns. Uh, but, but this is an issue because quarter ends happen from time to time. Uh, and uh, I think we all uh, understand the, why it, quarter end is such a special time. European Banks are generally regulated for capital only at the ends of each quarter. And uh, they provide liberal funding in the repo market in the middle of the quarter because they're not being monitored for capital in the middle of the quarter. But at the end of the quarter, they want to meet their capital requirements so they bring down their repo books very substantially on average. And that means that all of the funding that was being provided by European and, and other foreign banks, not just Europe, all of that funding now has to be provided incrementally by the US banks. Uh, they are not gonna store up a huge amount of reserves just for one day on the quarter end. Uh, that would impinge on their capital requirements because reserves are attached to capital and 
under the supplementary leverage ratio rule. So they're going to wait till the end of the quarter, and it's not so bad for them because they're going to be able to lend money at very generous, uh, uh, at very liberally high rates. In fact, one could even say they have more market power on the quarter end because a lot of their competition has disappeared from the market. What's the overall problem that we're talking about in the United States system? It's that the bond market is simply getting too big for the balance sheets of these largest dealers. So here I'm stepping again a little bit away from the issue of reserves ampleness and just talking much more holistically. Is it possible for these very large financial institutions to intermediate such an enormous market, both the cash market and the repo market, on their own balance sheets? Do we need some changes in the structure and regulation of bond markets quite generally in order to, in, in order to circumvent this problem? So on the vertical axis of this uh, chart is the ratio of the total quantity of US Treasury securities to the total size of the balance sheets of all primary dealers, whether US or foreign, uh, that is non-US primary dealers. And you can see that leading up to the financial crisis, the situation was looking pretty good in terms of the ability of the banks to intermediate the treasury market because banks were growing like crazy under light regulation, light capital regulation. And at the same time, the US Treasury market, while growing, was not growing uh, like crazy as it is today. Post-financial crisis, uh, many of you in the room and others around the world uh, got the idea, thank thankfully, that the banks needed to be seriously regulated for uh, financial stability to have enough capital. And because uh, they are now well regulated for having enough capital, the incentive that they have to expand their balance sheets in order to provide additional liquidity to the market has gone down. They haven't raised the sizes of their balance sheets any faster really than GDP, a little bit slower than GDP. But the treasury market has not, uh, has not grown slowly, it's grown extremely rapidly uh, on the backs of US fiscal uh, uh, needs and desires uh, in Congress. So the treasury market has, go has grown astronomically to the point at which we now have four times the size of the bond market that we had pre-crisis per unit of dealer balance sheet. That's the, key, that's the key issue. So we should question, are these balance sheets capable of intermediating the market on stress days? On a normal day, by the way, uh, the old adage that the US Treasury market is the world's deepest and most liquid market is definitely true. In fact, even on stress days, it's still the world's deepest and most liquid market. The question is whether the financing of Treasury securities and the trading of Treasury securities Will, uh, will be a bulwark of safe haven investors around the world uh, because they need financing or uh, liquidity for their securities on the most stressful days. Those are the days that really count. This is a chart that was uh, released with the latest Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee charges document. So some of you know that the US Treasury Department uh, impanels uh, a committee of prominent private sector uh, participants in financial markets and ask them for advice. And one of the charges, that is the questions asked by the Treasury Department to the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee in its last charges was, what about market functioning in the US Treasury market? And uh, by the way, I highly recommend the entire presentation of TBAC. They go through many of the issues that I've discussed today. But one of these charts shows again, in a different metric, that the balance sheets of these uh, large intermediaries, the primary dealers, are shrinking relative to the size of the market. This is the ratio of primary dealer gross positions in treasuries and financing to the total outstanding quantity of treasury securities, which is now on the order of about half of what it was uh, in 2012 and shrinking by projections. The Congressional Budget Office predicts that where we are at 28 trillion of treasuries outstanding today, there will be 50.3 trillion of treasuries in 10 years in the year 2034, and that uh, treasuries outstanding to GDP will grow to an excess of 150% by midway in this century. Uh, so uh, this is a very foreseeable situation for policy markers, uh, makers that the bond markets are getting very big relative to the intermediaries that are solely responsible or almost solely responsible for intermediating this market for non-bank investors around the world. Okay, finally we get to a list of uh, 
of key uh, potential ways to mitigate this situation, one of which is to update the leverage ratio rule requirement, uh, which makes it very difficult uh, today for the central banks to uh, use market operations to provide liquidity. If they're trying to relieve the largest dealer banks of their treasury securities in order to make more space on those dealer balance sheets to intermediate the market, how do they take those treasuries away from the dealer banks? They pay for them with reserves. If you pay for them with reserves, then you haven't really done anything with respect to the supplementary leverage ratio because you've replaced one thing with another that has the same capital charge. Some recent work by Falk Breining and Hilary Stein at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston shows that when the SLR exempted treasuries and reserves at the end of March of 2020, suddenly the banks that had been constrained by SLR headroom at the end of the previous year were able to expand their balance sheets to, to hold more treasury securities. And that's a cross-dealer uh, uh, treatment effect uh, that was a, a very effective demonstration that the SLR was holding up intermediation in this market, and in my view, not effectively, because you don't really need capital to protect you against the loss of uh, value on a central bank deposit. That's the whole idea of central bank deposits. They're always worth one. Second idea is to uh, revisit the uh, additional facilities that the central bank can provide for financing in the repo market when things get tough. Uh, the US Central Bank put up the standing repo facility uh, shortly after the COVID crisis. It was only tested for the first time, I mentioned, on September 30th of this year. And time will be the judge. Uh, we don't know yet how effective it's gonna be. It wasn't particularly effective at the end of the last quarter in mitigating the problems that we saw. Now, I don't wanna portray September 30th as a dangerous event, but it was uh, a signal that uh, the standing repo facility is not guaranteed to do the job that it set out to do. Uh, the, the design issue of these facilities is crucial. So one, uh, one design issue is, a, is it going to be a contingent facility that becomes available when suggested by the central bank due to stress, or is it going to be a standing facility like the feds? Another issue is how broadly were these, are these financings going to be made available? Is it going to be only to primary dealers and banks, which is the standing repo facility, or is it going to be provided to a wider set of market participants? Uh, I was on the working group set up by Tim Geithner, the G30 report uh, that we wrote before the standing repo facility was released suggested a wider set of counterparties, uh, partly because the balance sheets, the capital requirements of these largest banks can be a bottleneck when the Fed wants to provide funding to the market. They need not be the liquid conduit that we would all hope they would be. Uh, now that raises other issues, uh, which is if it's a broadly based facility, does the, does the central bank need to uh, worry about the credit quality of many different uh, counterparties in the repo market? And that is actually, that would jump us down uh, to number five on my list, a bit out of order. Uh, something I suggested recently is that uh, central banks should consider central clearing of their financing operations. And then it would face hopefully a well-regulated central counterparty and not face, uh, if it has a wide facility, not face a very large number of non-bank uh, counterparties in the repo market. The other advantage of doing that is that uh, when uh, one of these the dealer banks is getting funding from the Fed and providing funding to others, it has two legs that add to its assets and therefore uh, its capital requirements, and it is averse, most central banks, most com large commercial banks are averse to increasing their equity capital in order to handle uh, two very large books in the repo market. Uh, however, if it's centrally cleared, if both counterparties are centrally clearing, then the dealer banks in the middle are collapsing their long and short repo books, and it makes uh, much more efficient use of their space. So I would advocate that central banks such as the Fed seriously consider central clearing their repurchase agreements uh, uh, in facilities such as the SRF. By the way, a similar suggestion showed up in the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee charge document that I just mentioned a moment ago. They didn't say, we want the Fed to do this. They just said the Fed should consider or it should be considered, you know, the language that we usually see. 
Uh, okay, so here's something uh, that you might not have expected to come up in a, in a conference like today, which is liquidity savings mechanisms for your payment systems. Uh, the Fedwire, which is the backbone payment system in the United States, is in my view uh, behind the more advanced uh, uh, payment systems that are used at other central banks like the Bank of Canada, which has links, and the Bank of England's, and I can learn more from the ECB later today about what liquidity savings mechanisms that you're using. But some of these more advanced payment systems are providing incentives or rules that encourage people to pay Loriana earlier in the day so that she will pay others earlier in the day. And we won't have this uh, kind of musical chairs uh, negative feedback effect of people waiting for people because the money will be rolling through the system at a, at a, uh, with incentives for it to, to move through quickly. And then Loriana will be more likely to give Luke uh, a loan in the repo market uh, at a reasonable rate if she's not as worried about getting paid early in the day. Um, so some of these rules include, for example, throughput rules. But if you look at the link system in Canada, it also has look ahead netting opportunities so that Loriana can see coming ahead in the next payment window, which is some uh, hourly period during the day, that she has incoming money that she can net against her outgoing money so she doesn't need to have to save up as much reserves to meet her uh, requirements. Another problem that you may have noticed in the entire discussion is that we have missing markets, which are markets for delivery of securities against cash in the middle of the day. Recently, the Bank of New York Mellon has opened new facilities for early in the day and intraday repos. So now, if Loriana just needs money for an hour, she can borrow it at a very low cost, uh, 10 basis points for the Bank of New York Mellon as a fee, plus uh, whatever the overnight rate is times one hour over 360 days, which is a very small, a very small cost to Loriana to getting through this next short period. Uh, so I, I would encourage where you, where you have missing markets and a lot of this backup in the middle of the day payments that is causing backup in the repo financing market to consider uh, these middle of the day markets, uh, which are now existing at least. I already talked about central bank clearing of repo operations. Uh, Europe has direct all to all repo markets. Now I understand in Europe it's mostly banks on both sides of that market, but in the United States there's very little in the way of direct all to all repo markets and there is nothing in the way of direct all to all uh, cash securities markets. That is an opportunity. Again, remember the problem here is constraints on dealer balance sheets is one element of this. If dealer balance sheets are not big enough to do it on their own, then they can contribute to providing liquidity on off balance sheet uh, exchanges for direct financing between ultimate investor and ultimate uh, borrower. And then finally, uh, come back to the issue of the standing repo facility on the discount window and ask, uh, are they doing their job effectively in the United States? Stigma is a concern that's been raised uh, by many as to whether these facilities are in fact providing what Isabel called a demand-based uh, monetary policy transmission, providing reserves when they're needed so that you don't have to provide an enormous, enormously abundant amount of reserves all the time with the consequent cost side that I mentioned earlier of Fed footprint, volatile interest rates, crowding out, uh, and so on. Now, I, I, I just covered uh, at a very high pace a lot of different concepts, but now we can relax for a few minutes, perhaps, Christoph, and just uh, talk. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Daryl. That was a fascinating talk. I would now open the floor for questions from the audience. I mean, maybe while waiting. Um, I found fascinating and I was reminded of the late 1990s when there was a discussion on whether US debt would disappear with the Clinton surpluses. But it seems we're now in a different world with different kind of issues. So I have uh, Francesco Papadia, please. Yeah, I wonder whether in your seven uh, uh, ways to deal with the problem, uh, there should not be an eighth one, which would be um, central bank intraday facilities. Uh, I mean, if it's a, a missing market, of course, uh, uh, BNY can, can deal with it, but maybe the Fed can also deal with it. Shall we take one or two more? Okay. I think there was Luke and then... Uh, here in the front. 
Uh, here, look. Is Isabel has a question too. Yeah. Thanks, Isabel Christophe uh, Lucla um, at the ECB. So, there are the. Um, just when I listened to your talk, is, is the root cause of the problem also the market structure where everything has to go through this handful of dealer banks that actually are becoming bigger and bigger? But what you're telling us is they will never be big enough going forward, especially. Um, and um, so there seems to be some competitiveness issue here as well, where maybe. So anyway, is there something along that in terms of some intervention that would also change the market structure? So we don't are basically lowering the dependence on this handful of broker dealers. Would that be a fruitful way to think or not? Is that too interventionist for your take? Can I maybe do these two? Two and then I'll forget. I'm going to do two at a time because at my it's late in the afternoon and I'm jet lagged. And I, want to, I can't hold more than two in my buffer. So uh, Francesco, it's a terrific question. Why doesn't uh, the central bank uh, consider the possibility of providing intraday financing? I, I actually, I never thought of it until you suggested it. I want to think about it. There is this footprint issue of uh, whether, if it can be done in the private sector, and this is a, what uh, Moritz called the chicken, the chicken problem earlier today. Uh, if it can be done in the private sector, then maybe having the central bank do it uh, might not be necessary. But Maybe there are situations in which it would be very helpful uh, when, sent, when large dealer bank balance sheets are completely blocked. Uh, so I'll think about it and come back to you if that's OK. And uh, Luke's question, uh, which is uh, like the central question, is how do we overcome this uh, key problem that everything has to go onto and off of the balance sheets of a small number of very large banks? The reason uh, that we have such large banks doing most of it today is that there are huge network economies associated with netting longs against shorts. And that's why, for example, I recommended the Fed do its uh, uh, repo operations uh, through a central, uh, centrally cleared, because that al allows those netting effects to be even more powerful. But you might ask, as you did, uh, well, isn't there any other market structure than, than using these giant banks and trying to get maximal network effects from them when they're under capital requirements that discourage them from getting even bigger and, and absorbing the, the need for liquidity. And I mentioned the possibility of all-to-all -all markets. The dealer banks themselves would not favor, and I've discussed it with them, all-to-all -all markets. They think that it's unnecessary. Uh, and they also think that uh, those markets would be relatively less effective than uh, what the dealer banks themselves are providing to the market. Well, you have to ask, uh, you know, uh, which market structure would they prefer uh, for their own shareholders? And I think you can draw your own conclusions about that. Uh, you can also ask whether the, this is a point of intervention uh, by policymakers. And I've actually suggested that it should not be mandated that you have all-to-all -all trade, because uh, putting your finger on that scale uh, means you have to design the rules so that you're essentially prescribing what all-to-all -all trade means. And then in a few years, when the rules should be changed, you could be late uh, adapting. But uh, you can provide organic incentives, more uh, price transparency, uh, less, uh, uh, less um, well, uh, let me put it simply. There are alternative trading system rules in the US system that exempt US treasuries from the requirement that you have fair access to all investors. Uh, you have very limited but growing fast because of the new SEC rule, central clearing, which is a prerequisite uh, to all to all trade. So if you bring in more transparency, more open access, and more straight through central processing and central clearing, then exchange platform operators will come to the market. Uh, and hopefully that will mitigate the reliance, essentially 100% reliance on these giant banks. Thank you. So let's take another round. I see there's a lot of interest, but there was a question behind Luke uh, here. Just wait one second for the mic and then Isabel, and then we take, can take another round. Yeah, I'm, I will try to collect all questions. Daryl, for the enlightening keynote. Um, so I have, I'm curious about why the bank started with lower balances, like that caused the delay that was earning early warning system. So 
are all the lower balances the same or some particular reasons that there are episodes of lower balances that trigger a repo spike and others don't? Terrific. Well, first of all, we looked at the distribution of balances across the banks. And uh, the good news is that as total reserves go down, the balances get distributed more evenly across the dealer banks. Uh, so that means that they are good in some ways at sharing uh, the minimum balances. The Fed determines the total balances in the system, but the dealer banks are able to gather more if they wish. Now, why wouldn't uh, banks that think that they might have an advantage in gathering more reserves, why don't they just get more? Supplementary leverage ratio, it adds to their capital requirements. So that's, that's the main reason. I would suggest that reserves be exempted from the SLR. The Bank of England recently exempted uh, reserves from their own uh, leverage ratio rule. And I'm not sure that that move was well appreciated by all central bankers around the world at the time. But from, the US, uh, from a US uh, perspective, I think it, it's well past the time at which reserves should be exempted uh, from the supplementary leverage ratio. Of course, in the case of the US, the SLR is much more, uh, it's nearly double uh, the leverage ratio rule that you have here in the Eurozone. Thanks. And then we have Isabel, please. So thank you so much, uh, Daryl. It was a real pleasure listening to you. I know of uh, no other person who's able to talk about these rather technical issues in, in such a clear, and uh, I would even say an entertaining uh, way. So um, when I look at the title of, uh, of your speech, it's still very firmly grounded in this kind of supply-driven uh, framework of, of the Fed. Uh, if I look at your proposals, I get the impression that some of them go a bit in the direction of a demand-driven uh, system. So my, my question would be whether you would go as far as recommending to the Fed to rather switch to a demand-driven system, which of course would then imply that uh, the communication about the facilities would have to be very different. They should then not be portrayed as uh, backstop facilities, but they would need to be portrayed as facilities that can be used uh, at any time when needed, and it would even be encouraged to use them, as, as we uh, now also do. Uh, and then just a quick question on the leverage ratio. So if uh, there, there was an exemption, uh, of, of reserves, would you then uh, suggest that uh, the level of the leverage ratio would need to be recalibrated accordingly? Great, so two parts. Uh, so first, the Fed uh, is a very large organization with many parts. So uh, some uh, speakers in the Fed, I'll give you one example, and I don't want to single anyone in specifically, but it comes to mind that uh, the president of the Dallas Fed, Lori Logan, has spoken very positively about the idea of a demand-based system. The standing repo facility standing means open all the time, uh, and it's encouraged uh, that dealer banks come to this facility whenever they might need funding. The, the concern uh, is uh, that two things, well, one, I'll focus on one thing, which is the, the uh, concern by uh, one of the largest banks that if it goes to either the discount window or the standing repo facility, uh, someone uh, on the supervisory side of the Fed is looking over their shoulder and saying, excuse me, but under the post Dodd Frank world, uh, you shouldn't be needing funding from the central bank. You should be self-sufficient. And that is our objective. And you have these intraday liquidity requirements associated with resolution and recovery planning and regulation YY that say, even in the middle of the day, you need to be self-sufficient. So the supervisory's voice is kind of a bit scary for the reserves manager on the desk at the largest banks. They don't want to get a note uh, to their boss saying, from the supervisor saying, uh, somehow or other, the, uh, the payments desk at your bank uh, or the uh, borrowing desk at your bank has felt it necessary to come to the central bank for funding. And we're just wondering, what issues you might have that you're not meeting your own uh, liquidity requirements. Uh, so again, it's a, the Fed is a, a multifaceted organization. I think the spirit of your suggestion is in place, in the right places in the Fed. Uh, but for whatever reason, and I'm not an expert on the inner workings of the Fed, for whatever reason, banks are reluctant uh, to go to the discount window in the standing repo facility. Another group, G30 group, that I worked with, uh, chaired by Bill Dudley, there were four of us, uh, 
Stein von Klassen's, Trish Mosser, myself, and Bill, uh, recommended that the discount window become front and center in liquidity provision to the US banking system by requiring that US banks have pre-position collateral at the discount window to the extent that they have runnable liabilities. And that in and of itself would jumpstart uh, the use of the discount window and destigmatize it because banks would then, in principle, uh, whenever they need funding, they couldn't go elsewhere. They would have to go to the Fed, at, not in the, every instance, but in many instances. Is that contrary to the spirit of uh, the self-sufficiency of liquidity in the post-Basel world? Well, I would be OK with that. Uh, I, I recommend that, uh, that banks manage their own, own liquidity with their own assets pre-positioned at the discount window rather than being afraid to use the discount window. Uh, so that's, and uh, Vice Chair Michael Barr is working on getting banks uh, familiar with and willing to use the discount window when they need it. So yeah, I think the, the short answer is it's a work in progress at the Fed. There are many Fed people here that can probably enlighten you better than I just have. Thank you. Maybe we can take two more questions from the far end of the room, not to forget you. Uh, thank you, Daryl, for the excellent lecture. And uh, I'm Daryl Ho from the Hong Kong Ministry Authority. Um, I just want to echo the point made by Francesco just now about, you know, it, it is a problem of intraday liquidity in the sense that, you know, we don't have a sufficient lubricants in the system to make sure that everybody can meet the payment obligation towards the end of the day. And therefore, you have the tightness towards the end of the day. Um, and, and the solution to this problem may not necessarily be increasing the supply of reserves because the, I, I noticed that you know, you, you, you're, you're trying to address an issue of gauging the minimum ample quantity of reserves. But I think the problem that we have you know, in the end of September 2019 is that you know, it's a shortage of intraday liquidity but not the day-end liquidity. So, of course, you can actually solve the problem by pumping up you know, the overall supply of reserves and therefore you know, it will li just lubricate the system. But uh, you can also consider, just like Francesco suggested, that you know, the central bank to provide the intraday liquidity during the daytime and withdraw the liquidity towards the day end and, 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 and so be it, you, know, you can actually address the issue. And this is a system that you know, Hong Kong adopted that you know, when the banks, you know, when they actually the market opens, uh, the, all the central bank paper held by banks sitting on the central securities depository will be automatically turning into reserves. So the level of reserves would expand by about four folds, you know, in, 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 when the market's open and everybody have ample of liquidity to meet their intraday payments. And towards the end of the day, this intraday discount window will be reversed. So going back to the original reserves position. So maybe that could be a useful solution to the problem. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, I guess we should talk afterwards. I want to learn more about the Hong Kong uh, Monetary Authority System, HKMA. OK. Yes, please. Can you in the second? Uh, hi. Can you take the mic? Um, Vicky Support, I'm responsible for the markets area at the, at the Bank of England. So um, I uh, just uh, wanted um, to reinforce your point about um, the desirability of regular of the sort of supervisory arm of uh, of the uh, of a central bank um, and the sort of markets if you want monetary policy implementation of the arm to try to work together on some of these things so when we launched um, the equivalent of the standing repo facility the short-term repo facility which we launched after we had learned from the 2019 uh, events uh, in, in the Fed, so we had that hindsight. Um, we actually made sure that our supervisory colleagues, and we had to go through the governance processes, said that for them, this is normal uh, uh, liquidity, and there is, uh, they, can, they, they can use it in the regulatory returns, in the liquidity stress tests, et cetera, as, as, any other, um, um, as any other facility. And we understand from market intelligence that we have that this was um, a very important aspect for uh, destigmatization. Uh, however, as Isabel uh, said, and it, it has worked, basically. I mean, somebody talked about earlier, I mean, at the moment, 
you know, the, the, the demand is 46 billion uh, a week uh, on the short term repo facility and um, ahead of balance sheet spike days, quarter ends, it kind of uh, uh, goes up. But I, I just would like to reinforce the point. It is also, I think, important because that's the feedback we also get for another facility we have, which is against broader collateral, which we're also extremely keen that it is used as we drain down the reserves um, uh, to actually, the labeling of the facility is quite important in our view, whether you call it backstop or whether you call it um, business as usual. And do you know the reason? The reason is, is because you talked about central banks having different departments, but actually banks have different departments. And the policy people in the commercial bank, if they look at something in the policy document that says, this is for liquidity insurance, this is for backstop, this, this also plays a role in how they come and actually use it and how the board actually looks at it. So just to reinforce uh, your, your point, including the large value payment system having liquidity savings mechanisms, and that's the reason why we don't have the issues that you said. I know you have had a conversation with the governor on this because it came to me. <laughs> so um, so the, um, uh, I have a question. I, I was actually involved with removing reserves uh, from the leverage ratio, and we did it at the... Uh, Actually, it's quite quite a few years ago. It was um, after uh, the Brexit referendum in 2016. Um, however, so you're right, it's there. However, it does increase the demand for reserves, and particularly so for leverage-constrained banks. So for banks that are not constrained by the risk-based requirements, but by the leverage requirements. So it increased the footprint so I would, uh, in, in, the, in, that, in that sense, so how do you think about that? Because there's a cost benefit on that. That's point one. And point two, you say, to some extent, there's no risk because it's the only uh, asset with, uh, with, with value of one. This is true for the banking system, but there is a risk that the central bank takes. So if it supplies the reserves through uh, uh, purchasing government bonds, there is an interest rate risk if it supplies. So it takes the public sector, the government takes interest rate risk. And you also talked in your first slide about footprint and volatility of income. So how do you think about that as well in terms of the leverage ratio? Thank Ter you. Terrific question. Uh, so on the first point, yes, I, I did speak to your governor. I spoke to Sarah Breeden. <laughs> I really admire uh, both the work that you've done on your payment system throughput using liquidity savings mechanisms and the design of your contingent uh, 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 repo financing facility. I think they're both good models. Bank of Canada also has a very small footprint uh, in terms of its balance sheet relative to the size of its economy, in part uh, because of similar uh, advances that they've made in liquidity savings mechanisms and uh, contingent funding, which is on demand uh, rather than on permanent supply. So that's, uh, those are terrific features. What about the problem of oversupply of reserves? Well, of course, you control the supply of reserves. Some central banks have thought about tiering uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the interest paid on uh, central bank deposits if you think that there is an issue uh, with uh, some banks just using them, as I said, as a Swiss army knife for every possible application and increasing the footprint of the central bank excessively. I mean, some central banks have thought about tiering uh, on the deposit rate, and I, that seems a natural one uh, to consider. I'm, uh, so maybe we could talk about that later, but thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl. I'm afraid that brings us to the end of this session. This was terrific, and you can see there's a lot of interest. I would encourage all of you who still had questions to talk to Daryl during the coffee break or the various breaks we will have over the coming two days. Um, I was asked also to remind you before we start the coffee break, there will be a poster session. Actually, the authors are standing next to the posters already. So please have a look and engage with the authors. And with that, let me thank you, Daryl. That was terrific. Thank you Thanks very much.